welcome. Uh, we have we are starting a poetry series. Apparently, this is a Judy uh, makes two, so uh, we're going to have a third uh, in uh, Joyce Young. She's going to be in June, and of course, I didn't bring the exact date, but uh, we are also branding the series. It's clearly meant at the Claremont branch. <laughs> My name is Glenn Ingersoll. Welcome. Uh, Judy Bevelar will be reading for us for about 20 minutes, and then uh, we'll have a little chat interview. Nothing too high pressure. Uh, and then after that, uh, hopefully people will ask questions or have something to add to uh, community feel rather than a uh, you know, purely audience. I'd like to introduce Judy Bevelar. She has taught in the San Francisco Public High school for 37 years. Her students won many writing honors, including eight scholastic writing awards. Judy's poetry appears in the anthologies The Widow's Handbook, Turning a Train of Thought Upside Down, and River of Earth and Sky. Her chapbook, Walking Across the Pacific, was published in 2014. It's also available in the Berkeley Collection. But a whole lot, I think, it's checked out. And she has copies. She co-hosts a reading series for the Barrier Writing Project at Expressions Gallery in Berkeley. And Along with Marty. Oh, with William. And she has a book forthcoming this year. What was the title? Called, and Then They Were Gone, Teenagers of People's Temple from San Francisco to, from high school, we changed the title, subtitle, to Jonestown. Because Jim Jones sent all the uh, the high school age kids to the small alternative school at that time. Well, thank you. I look forward to your reading. Judy Bevel. Thank you for coming. And you all get a picnic the next sunny day. <laughs> <laughs> I bequeathed it to you. And Glenn forgot to mention that, as well as being a wonderful librarian, he's a pretty darn good poet himself. So. I think his heart is really in this series, and I hope it grows and grows. And what a nice thing to do for mm -hmm. poets. I feel so honored to be in my little neighborhood library where I've been coming for years and years and years. And now I have two books, because the Widow's Handbook is also here. And last time I looked, a lot of people had checked it out. And now here I am in person. I'm not so I'm going to start with a poem that I often use at the beginning of readings because it makes me take a breath and relax. I'm, I'm fine in front of high school kids, but <laughs> it took me a while to get used to high school kids, but you have to adapt really fast. <laughs> in that case, I loved teaching. I really enjoyed it. So, how many of you study yoga at all? So you know Shavasana. This is about Shavasana, and it's called breath. We were beginning to stir, after Shavasana, the corpse pose, in which one lies supine, wings of the nose, root of the tongue, forehead and spine and limbs, all soft and easy. Stray thoughts, just clouds passing by. The mine are sometimes more like bumper cars. <laughs> but this time, for an instant, I was breathing with the universe. The darkness of space, lightning, then deepening. Stars floating out, then rolling back in like the tides. Galaxies sailing gracefully to the edge of nothing and returning to the center once more. When I got home, I asked my husband from the kitchen where I chopped onions and celery, do you know if they've decided yet whether the universe is expanding or contracting? There have been budget cuts. He called them. <laughs> it's shrinking. <laughs> uh, 
And then I heard a woman on the radio who said, with each breath, we take in the dust of the Gobi Desert, of the Sahara, of the Serengeti Plains. She said, we breathe in the dust of stars. And then, of course, we breathe it out again. The earth is ever decomposing, releasing detritus of graves. We take in particles of emperors and concubines, of pharaohs and their slaves, of black elk on his eagle beer. Today at coffee, I asked a friend what she thought. She said, we don't seem to take in wisdom with the dust. She said, the earth is the universe has been expanding ever since the Big Bang, which would explain why the gaps are widening between nations and tribes and factions and sects, why the divorce rate is high, why families feud, why so many seem eager to gallop towards apocalypse. Still, if I take a deep breath and close my eyes, rushing by and people who talk too much, and jet exhaust and red-tailed hawks. This has something to do with plum blossoms every February and then hard rain. This has something to do with the curve of future plans with Esalen, Constantinople, Positano, the French Riviera, with trips that may never be made and hope gone awry. This has something to do with fires, full lunar eclipses, and sudden gusts of wind blowing down 50-year-old elms. This has something to do with nests falling out of trees. This has something to do with swimming all the way to the raft and lying on hot wood with silty water drying on your skin, a hand flung over your eyes to keep out the sun, something to do with wars and babies, with uterine cancer, and a nice, calm game of draw poker. This has something to do with birthdays, and friends, and just missed trains. Something to do with cedar and spring bamboo, with the shades of green and yellow in a sun-struck cornfield, with the gaze directed at the horizon, and balance. This has something to do with moss between stones, with blue between patches of clouds, the moment between inhale and exhale, with how John died that beautiful June, and with how improbable it was that I met you because of a broken hinge on a broken door, now the door to our bedroom made lovely. This, my chapbook, Walking Across the Pacific, the photograph on the front is from my first husband's memorial. He had lymphoma and died at age 49 in 1991. And I still find him in my poems about when I had my house remodeled, I met Alan. It was kind of confusing <laughs> at first. <laughs> I'd have dreams. Um, and this one is, uh, well, it's our first date, Alice and mine. Uh, there used to be gliders up in Calistoga. Not anymore, sadly, but gliding. They are thigh to thigh in the narrow seat, dipping, turning on insubstantial air. The pilot wonders if they'd like to do a loop. He wants to answer yes, but he asks her 
first. She's afraid, so he tells the pilot, no. They are in love, or she is in love. It's too soon. He's too young. She is in love with his arm around her shoulders. It's been so long. Or in love with the curly crowd of blonde hairs glistening on his brown forearm, muscle from hammer and saw, with a smile and his voice on the phone. But up here, floating with the rafters, who can tell? They don't talk, sitting so close, looking down at vineyards, barns, oaks spread out like illustrations in a children's book. The glider rattles, but she doesn't hear. She's thinking she wouldn't mind if he kissed her, but it's too soon after her husband's death. He was too young to die, and she's old enough to know better, isn't she? She's probably just a little giddy up here so far. <laughs> and then from the lovely little chat book that Gwen made, Lopensky Lumber. A country song echoes through the warehouse, cedar and summer dust, the words unintelligible, but the tempo, nostalgia melody in a minor key of longing. At 17, I rode with a boy out Refinery Road to Avon, past the slough, the railroad tracks, or the road through Franklin Canyon, low slung oaks, tracing desires, deliberate turns, a September sky holding the fall. Now I sit in this red truck waiting, you in the dark loft, draw at the best pieces of Alaskan yellow, and the slide of wood on wood sings too. We stack the eight quarter planks on the rack in rhythm and climb in. I'm old enough to have learned how things can change the feet. In the truck, you open the window to the tune's fading drift. I slide close. Red-tailed hawk. And it's, it's appeared in a couple of my poems. I love them, and they, like some other birds, make for life. Red-tailed hawk. In spring's green ease, a pair of red-tailed hawks draws slow circles high above a windy field. The male begins to plummet and rise over and over, a miracle of arc and reach. His eyes cut obsidian, yellow fire. He touches her, and then the two, pulling light through widespread feathers, grasp talons and spiral down, a wild courtship against brilliant coastal blue. From the shambles of summer, they weave a nest from wildness, wind and grass, steady beat of sea on rock, bark and husk. Stocks. Autumn, her chicks soft and wary, watch from a tall eucalyptus as the female circles over the field, hovers, then slips down a flash of darkness, trailing light. Her mate nearby follows her sweep to the grass. And um, I don't know if, and how many of you know, but there's a, an installation by James Terrell outside of the de Young Museum. Have you ever been in that little building? If you walk out by the cafe across the grass, then there's a little path that leads to it. And like, I think everything he's done except this, maybe, um, it's in it, well, that's, this is about an enclosed space too, but a huge one but he makes things in enclosed spaces so that when the light comes through, 
things happen. His most recent one is in a volcano, uh, not an active volcano. But <laughs> 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 you might do that though, <laughs> where the light is going to hit certain things at certain times of the year the way it did in Akiva. And um, this was an installation at the Guggenheim called Otten Rain. And Muriel and I were there and saw it. And the Guggenheim, you know, is that one that circles around and the light comes from the top. That was the installation. There were some people lying on a rug in the center of the bottom floor and some, the rest of us sat on benches mm -hmm. around and looked up. And this is what we saw. Light falling from 18 billion years ago from stars or from stage lights Light cascading down like rain, like a blessing. My heart beats more slowly as the soft blue deepens shade by shade into royal blue at the lowest tier of the rotunda's ascending spheres. And already the light falling from the highest sphere in the dome is now rose, becoming warmer as it spills from each ring of light and my breath quickens, my heart pumps time away faster, and yet here we are in a realm without time, mesmerized by yellow now into peach, and the world outside with its racket and clatter, its cursing and spitting, less real than the light falling all around, like the light near water, we silent watchers bound to one another by the falling And this one happened after a friend and I went to write up in Tilton Park. And as we sat down, she said, choose, if you were going to choose just one word, what would it be? Mm -hmm. A friend asks me to choose one word. If I could own a word, just one? It would be sky, I said to my friend, thinking, then this breeze making leaf shadows would be mine. And the way the afternoon light has a soft weft a hand like fine silk. I could claim the sun itself, the bird calls lacing the air, bee buzz over clover, lazy rustle of green. This particular sky is intensely blue over summer gold, folding hills like lions sleeping under scattered canopies of oak. But I could never own all the skies layered black. And this, I have people from the gym here, so <laughs> this is my gym talk. <laughs> and um, do all of you know that song by the Weather Girls, where it's raining men from the sky? <laughs> oh, it's over these songs. <laughs> and my, this poem is dedicated to my first student teacher, Vanessa, and she, we always danced to I really like this one, it's worse than the song. <laughs> Zumba class at the gym. The weather girls are singing, it's going to be raining men for the first time in history <laughs> at just about <laughs> half past ten. <laughs> An exultant chorus line, we two-step up and sashay back, open our arms to the sky. A girl in sparkly blue with a slim, bare, brown midriff pushes the glass doors open to scoot and leap with us. She's 20 or so, pulls her man down from the sky, handsome and dark, as we pull ours, some of us more than one. <laughs> God bless Mother Nature, for she's a single woman too. <laughs> Today, four men are part of our impromptu troupe, so the teacher says it's raining women too, in case. And the best dancer, maybe in the room, besides, of course, Vanessa, looks like a monk, 50-ish. His tonsure gleams in the overhead light. Instead of a monk's robe, a faded t-shirt, shorts, white socks, black shoes. But the guy can move, obviously in love with dance. We take a bow at the end, brushing the floor with our fingertips. Someone calls out, it takes a brave man to come to this class. 
and we women applaud and grin, as we often do for no particular reason except we're happy. The sparkly girl goes back to her weights and squats, but when Jump Drive-In comes on, she's back, and we have all turned 20 in the 20s. The Broadway theater become a funky roadhouse, and we slip and slide across box step, our hands jazzy birds. <laughs> Our feet stepping wider and wider, then it's finished, and Vanessa asks her voice, low and Latin, tango, see? We grow spelt, tan, our eyes hooded and sultry. We slide, fickle, headstrong, suddenly change directions, our eyes following our elegant hands. We kick the trains of our gowns back behind us, Attitude, Vanessa says, and our necks grow longer. We throw back our heads, the dance floor is crowded, yet each of us dances alone, full of disdain and pent up passion. <laughs> Who knows what we might do next? <laughs> <laughs> then when the flamenco music begins, Sparkly joins us again, and now all of us, the Chinese librarian, the chiropractor with bright red hair, the nurse with the purple headband, the widows whose husbands were wonderful dancers, the lawyers, the grandmothers, the young techies, the moms, the middle-aged couple who smile at one another, remembering, and the monk and me. We are all beautiful Spanish horses, prancing, shaking our proud manes. By a mas, the singer orders us, and we do bending down to touch our kicked across feet, sidestepping, careless, strong. Then chameleon-like, we change again. We are Oscar and Berto, cool and handsome. Hola, hombre. We greet one another with a mock battle dance, kicking left foot forward as we move closer, macho, hands up, punching our fists at the sky, shouting, hey, hey, to the Latin beat. Then we hurl down our dice on the sidewalk, walk, right arms held up high, nearly touching the floor as we throw, and we win, all of us. <laughs> the last dance is over, all of us sweaty, breathless, and happy. Vanessa tells us to turn to our audience, and behind the glass doors, the next class is waiting to enter. We reach up once more, to Mother Nature's sky full of angels and stars, place one toe daintily behind the other heel, and make deep bow. <laughs> Inside, we are all applause. <laughs> breakfast every 15 minutes, and it sure seems to me like time is going faster and faster and faster. <laughs> and there's a reference to a song in it, you probably know Bob Dylan's I'll Be Your Baby Tonight. My daughter has a beautiful singing voice. It's called The Funnel. It's all flowing through the funnel faster and faster, every wondrous or idiotically ordinary moment another grain of memory. It seems now, every other day or two, that the garbage recycling trucks bang and crash their way down the street in the early morning hours. And wasn't that just a few years ago, my daughter's wedding, votive candles floating in the pool of the rented house on Long Island, her voice like a sweet bird's flight, I'll be your baby tonight, her mouth on the mic, her eyes melting with his. And only a few before that, it seems, she was a toddler with a belly laugh and hair like a handful of yellow silk. It's a counting game. The child holds two fingers up, and we can't help but smile. Then it's three and four and five, then suddenly the teens, and then they're grown, living on the opposite coast in homes of their own. And all those years I spent in the classroom, blackboards time-lapsing into green, then white plastic, the desks morphing to 
from oak to steel tubing, wood grain from mica, still carved with initials, still bubblegum under the windows. <laughs> All those beautiful young faces, trusting and hopeful or anguished and closed, they couldn't possibly grow old, but did. Before you know it, you count backwards, lie a little, and you hate those cards with firemen and birthday cakes. <laughs> Instead of subtraction, I try to focus on the mysteries of calculus. I read last night that those who understand pure math at its highest levels are lo not looking for solutions, but beauty. When my friend Irene was dying, I think she was using that mathematical magic to climb back up to the mouth of the funnel, open to her entire life. She was a girl again, her husband said not sick in bed, but happy with friends on her way to a Baroque concert in a Spanish cathedral. We lit candles and sat with her. We could smell the plumeria lay. She looked peaceful, lovely, almost young. And John, her husband, said, loving drama as she did, she must have had something to do with the sudden darkness that night at the crematorium. The power out, we discovered later, all over the city. Welcome, welcome. There's one chair here. There's a stack of chairs. Oh, there's no chairs. You got the last one for the coming. You're fine. Branches bearing oranges, succulent forest grasses in a wilderness of bush cast shadows down and down, dark and dark. A small piece of hazy blue sky attempts to peer into the mystery. A kinkajou, almost hidden in the green, watches the two. A baby monkey is focused on his own small bright prize. Two, on Hillegas Avenue, the look in the little girl's dark eyes. Longing, a light of mischief, a minor chord of budding guilt glittering as she glances sideways at me, passing by. The oranges, so beautiful among the dark, shining leaves in the foggy morning light, so many hanging low enough for her to reach. Could have picked her one. Mohammed, who planted the tree, said I could. I should have placed it in her small hands. Three. The kinkajou's eyes are filled with want, sad. His ears point toward the monkeys and their prize. The baby monkey is focused on the bite of sweetness in his hands. Four. I still regret the not giving of the gift, not filling that little girl's face with light. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And last, I invited Lila to come, but she was too shy. She's in this room. <clears throat> She's my next door neighbor, and she and her dad are playing together right now. 
called How We Learn, and um, there are quotes from Rumi, who is the most popular, I think, by number of books sold in the world. I mean, if you count Shakespeare as a playwright, they would probably tie but <laughs> <laughs> How We Learn. Rumi said in the mineral, consciousness sleeps. In animals, it dreams. And in some humans, it is awake. I listen to my neighbor without any noise or annoyance with tell his three-year-old, Lila, in whose eyes he is the most wondrous of beings, even as he takes the trash out, say that no, he has to leave in five minutes, that he still has to find out where the place is and how to get there. She doesn't protest when, of course, she wants to play. Lila is the little one. Her big sister can ride a bike, walk to the end of the block alone, and it's still light outside, but she lets him go. I think it's our children who make us learn to be patient, kind, forgiving, because how can we teach our children what we are not? Mm -hmm. And I'll just end with this really short one. Um, it's called Ojai, which is probably all been to that beautiful valley. Um, and you really can find huge trees that have been bent over the creek, and you find out why from the home. If there weren't all these freeways, I would love you like the Indians in Ojai, bending trees over creeks, so people for, forever would know the fish lie thick in secret pools. Mm -hmm. Judy? What do you want to talk about? <laughs> uh, I noticed that uh, your poems are narrative, just about, without exception, at least of what you chose to read tonight. Mm -hmm. Is that? Most of them are. Else? I, I do sometimes. I think it comes from um, teaching poetry in high school classes all mm -hmm. those years. And what the kids wanted to do, and what was a great thing for them to do, was to share their stories with one another in poems. And I, and I think for that reason, too, I try to make my poems really accessible. I get annoyed at poems that you read through them and read through them again when you're still trying to figure out, what is that about? And that's what makes people say, oh, I don't like poetry. <laughs> so. What got you started writing poetry? Well, a third grade, I started writing poetry. Um, I, I, well, I loved Miss Goodman. But then when I became a high school teacher, it was sort of a sudden decision. I was going to go on to graduate school. I was going to be an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> I've been a terrible one now. And he's telling me the bridges would have fallen down. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I decided I, it was the 60s, and I decided I wanted to do, do something with meaning. And so I thought, I'll be the kind of high school teacher that I wanted to have, mm -hmm. um, but didn't. And then I chose to work with kids that weren't making it in school. There, there was a thing called continuation high schools where they sent kids who were 
suspended for more than 10 days or um, were in trouble or pregnant girls that they didn't want to be going to any of those schools who could only go as long as it didn't show shit that they were pregnant. It was a, my first husband called it the garbage can of the San Francisco Unified School mm -hmm. District because they sent the teachers and the principals there that they didn't know what else to do mm -hmm. with. But <clears throat> so, uh, four teachers and I out of a UC um, Berkeley teacher training program decided we wanted to go there and we wanted to help those kids and we were going to make things happen for them. And then one of us, very smart, decided, you know what, the time is right to ask for our own alternative school, public alternative school. And she was pretty savvy and we got opportunity one and then we decided we made a mistake with that one because the school district sent us a principal that didn't get what we were trying to do. And <laughs> um, uh, so we did the second one. But what worked with those kids, and you couldn't tell who was going to be there. The seven will be there this day, and mm -hmm. this six plus mm -hmm. two that were there yesterday would be the next day. And you know, so you sort of had to have self contained lessons mm -hmm. and poetry worked really well because mm -hmm. we could read a short one or I often brought poets into the classroom uh, and they could see what a real life poet was like and how much words meant to them and that, they, that poems were about people's lives and what mattered to them and then I published their books of poetry and a big calendar. So, I, you know, I, I've been thinking poetry all those years and writing when I could, but usually I had to go around and, because Marty would have her head down on the desk and I'd have to whisper into her ear an idea for what she could write about it. <laughs> or somebody else would be being noisy and I'd have to whisper in <laughs> But now that I'm retired, so you were, it sounds like you were writing poetry before you started teaching, that, that teaching changed it yeah. uh, in ways other than um, narrative, ways to, to grab people's attention. Well, I learned a lot from the kids, the, the things that they wrote about that would make the whole class be quiet when they read their poems. And it was things that were straight from the heart. First, I just wanted to describe pretty things, but I guess kind of boring after a while. Um, one of the poems that uh, was included in the little chat book, um, he wrote about going to Squaw Valley. And that's a, I've known about Squaw Valley for a long time, I've never been. Um, I liked the way it really traveled through a variety mm -hmm. of of um, play, uh, stories and uh, just pure description of, of place, uh, and it was addressed as a letter. Uh, you, and it's a kind of a foggy question, but speak about our relationship with writers and uh, in that sort of community. It's a wonderful place. Robert Haas who's a professor at UC Berkeley and who started the River of Words project. There's a big event every year in the park next to Berkeley High. It's really wonderful. Um, but he started Squaw Valley and six or seven really great, there's, there's fiction, nonfiction, um, movie writing, script writing, and poetry. They're all for uh, a week with weekends on both ends in Squaw Valley in the summertime. And <clears throat> it's wonderful because you really, they call it the Squaw Valley community of writers because you really do get to know a lot of other writers and they planned it so you go to this workshop one day and that workshop the next day and, and in such a way that there's a couple of people that follow you all the way through the workshops so you get to know their poems really well and then you get to meet everybody there in a writing workshop so you really develop wonderful relationships that usually last beyond the school of Have you done other uh, writers conferences like that? I went to Lake Como when my chapbook came out the, the publishing company was 
was co-sponsoring a, a trip to the Congo. And Italy? No, and Italy. Italy? Yeah. It was wonderful. <laughs> and I got to meet with Jane Smiley, who was one of the teachers at the workshop there. Did she write poetry? I hear she's a novelist. No, she, but they had her her novels. But yeah, they had a, a novel writing part of the workshop too. The same thing, different genres of writing. So you mentioned uh, the new book that you have coming out. Uh, it's, it's been in the works for some time. Mm -hmm. but Ten years. <laughs> <laughs> um, Autumn like, knows. Autumn <laughs> <laughs> is a wonderful writing teacher. Would you like to talk about the topic? Is it, is it yeah. something you can touch on my mm -hmm. um, Jim Jones sent all the teenagers to the small 200 plus uh, alternative school where I was in 1976. Who's Jim Jones? <laughs> That's my, my helper back there. <laughs> Jim Jones was the uh, infamous, the famous minister who became infamous uh, of the People's Temple Church. And he chose our school because our principal at that time was a declared socialist. And he thought, and he was as well. And so he thought this was the perfect place for his kids because gone would let the kids do whatever he wanted them to do. Um, and we actually, she broke the tradition of how kids were admitted. It was one at a time because for the most part they were kids also who had troubled lives and not doing well in school. Although some of them were just, you know, hippie kids that wanted to go to a school where they could be free and do their own projects and have some fun. So, but they came all in a big group. And then within nine months, he had shipped them, almost all of them, off to Guyana. Uh, a couple escaped, and their stories of, of escaping are in the book. And at first, the book was just like a brief. I had the kids' poetry. Another teacher, who was my partner in the project, was the coach of the baseball team that the Temple kids made possible because they actually showed up every day and they actually were good athletes and some of them loved baseball. Tim Jones, Jim Jones' adopted son. He probably would have become a professional baseball player if Jones Tim had And he survived, but you know, not, not without lots of scars. Then I had to do a lot of research on Jonestown because somebody said, wait a minute, you can't just give your memories, you have to make this into a story. So, and of course I didn't know much about what, what went on there, but I read a lot. And then Stephen Jones, who is Jim Jones' only biological son, he managed to survive pretty much unscarred. He's a really good human being. And uh, he met with me and emailed me and so I learned a lot, you know, from from what he told me and from correcting my errors about things. And, and that was real life there. He's a wonderful writer himself. There's a website called Alternative Considerations of Jonestown and People's Temple. It's done by San Diego State University. And you can find a lot of his writing there. And one of his stories is part of our book. It's called Roots about um, how a group of kids got together without Jim Jones knowing anything about it because one of the girls had thrown up her, she was a young girl, but she had false teeth, and she threw them up into the outhouse. And so Stephen rigged up this thing to lower the lightest and sort of most acrobatic of the boys <laughs> down through the <laughs> hole to pluck the teeth from the Yuck. <laughs> it's, it's a funny story, uh, and, it's, and it kind of shows you another side of Jonestown that kids were doing kids' camaraderie things and brave things and foolish things. And
that we started on that. It's hard to do. Quite a project. Uh, are you uh, are you moved on to a new project that you want to talk about? Or? I'm still finishing that. We have a publisher, um, Janie Dresser, Kimberly knows, a good writer, and who has a small uh, company called Sugartown Publishing. Uh, so I'm making last changes and working with her and where to put the pictures and which ones. But it should be out this year. <laughs> and you'll hear about it. <laughs> and this library will have a copy of it, no matter what. <laughs> Very good. Glad to hear that. And uh, are there any questions you I've missed that you would like me to ask? Well, are there questions anyone else would like to ask? I, I have a lot of questions about the uh, uh, Lipinski lumber. First place, Lipinski, Franklin Canyon, Alaska Yellow, riding in a red truck, stacking planks. What is your background with lumber, timbering? Um, where did all this come from? He's sitting like that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I really, the, the lumber company wasn't named Lopensky, but that mill, right? Yeah, so it's a mill, not a home yard. She 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 conflated two places, like Hollywood, you know, <laughs> you like the way one place it looks, but you don't like the name, so you take the name from yeah. another place. Yeah. So it actually it was by Norrisdale Harris, <laughs> and she took the mill name and, of Lopensky and changed it. And he made me a beautiful writing desk out of Alaska yellow cedar. And there's a lot of it in our house, so I know that very well. It's actually really not cedar, it's a cypress. Oh. <laughs> 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 Someone else? I already know everything. <laughs> writing is changing? Like, how do you see your writing changing? I mean, you know, I think that you primarily as a poet and Jonestown is kind of an aberration. <laughs> so I guess I'm really asking about your poetry. Like, how do you see your poetry evolving? Hmm. Well, we covered kind of one step of it. But also, I, I think it's evolving from reading other good poets hmm. and and learning that they do the, that thing of moving from place to place. Yeah, it reminded me of in, past. In a, yes. in a poem, and so I like to try to do that. And, and then workshops like Autumn's and Morning's, they're both really great writing teachers. And I have a, a workshop with a wonderful poet named Tom Santalella that meets at my house every second and fourth Tuesday. And I'm learning a lot from that. So I think it's, I don't know if it's so much changing. I think I'll always be more of a narrative poet, but I think it's getting better, you know, when I learn more about what metaphors are and how I tend to put too many descriptive things in and I just take them. <laughs> <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm still working on getting really good endings to poems. I think that's the hardest thing. Make something happen. I, some, of, some of the poems you read today I've heard, you know, and um, I, I love them. And I'm really interested in the way in which you bring in, like, um, a scientific notion. And it becomes, you know, much more than a fact or much it, like a metaphor and also a kind of philosophical one. And it's, I'm just wondering is is where did you always do that or is that um, more prevalent in some of your later poems? I think so, yeah. If I learn about something that I think, wow, that's pretty amazing, I do read in the list of stars. Mm -hmm. So are 
are you carrying around those uh, fabulous facts and then they find a place or are they engineering a kind of consideration that ends up in a poem? Yeah, I think it's the latter. Uh -huh. I stumble across something interesting and then they are watching it. Okay. Yeah. Have you ever researched for a poem? I tried to research, I have a poem that it, it's called Dark Matters, and Dark Matter is in it, and I tried mm -hmm. to, and I realized, I don't understand. <laughs> 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 and I don't think they really actually know what Dark Matter is <laughs> yet anyway, so. <laughs> I'm not very um, scholarly that way. I was curious. <laughs> uh, and you talked a little about writing groups. Um, so, and how feedback has changed. Are you to a place where you feel comfortable with any kind of feedback? Uh, that's, that can be, a, uh, you work with teams, you know that uh, criticism can be hurt, can yeah. be felt as a attack, or you know, uh, people can be very sensitive. Right. Um, do you feel sensitive or you've gotten Sometimes past that? I do, but I, I tend to go to really good workshops, like mm -hmm. the ones run by Marty or Autumn or Kimberly and I are in one where we read to one another, but I know all the people. And <laughs> <laughs> I like their poetry. I know they're good writers, but I also know they're not going to say something that makes me go, oh my god, this must be an awful poem. <laughs> 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 So you have to choose them. Yes. There's one workshop that I go to, and sometimes I come home, I think, they all say different things, yeah. and I don't know what to think. <laughs> That's true. Alan has a question. No, no, I was yes. just going to make an observation about this, the last group that you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, and I noticed the way you carry yourself, your mood, when you return from that one. And is that a, certainly the, the group where people are less concerned about sparing your feelings mm -hmm. and are more forthright? But it doesn't, you know, the next day you still get up and you have breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think it's a good, a good balance yeah. of a more, yeah. more nurturing group that is, uh, isn't going to say something, um, even though they may feel it strongly if they think it might, uh, you know, injure your feelings, and then be with the ones that are a little tougher. Mm -hmm. And the Tom group is kind of in between. We do a lot of laughing. We eat food and sometimes drink wine. And, uh, but Tom is really good and that he'll be really straightforward mm -hmm. with you about, you know, something that needs to be changed in the home. And other people will say criticisms, but after they've said something they like, and they'll say it in such a way that helps you know how to change it and not just, gee, that was stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have any do you have any poetry that's a little bit darker, maybe something that involves Jonestown? I do have. Um, yeah. I've only And is it in the book? Uh, it's no, it's not in any of these books. Hopefully someday I will have a full length book of my own poetry for sure. Those poems will go. The poem Dark Matters has some yeah. Jones in it. Because, I don't know if you know, but he ordered the babies killed first. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's pretty dark. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, who are a few of your favorite poets? Neruda, Shakespeare, um, uh, Robert Haas, I mm -hmm. think. Do you like Billy Collins? Oh, I love Billy yeah. Collins. <laughs> you are very similar to me. You're, you're oh, very similar. <laughs> I love the way he can make things really funny, but mm -hmm. very yeah. good at the same time. Yeah. And do, you, do you like Robert Haas? Because he does so much about nature, which it seems like you write a lot about as well. Right. But, but also, very, he writes a lot about people and the human heart. Mm -hmm. In the uh, the art of poetry is seemingly fairly you know off the mainstream. Uh, 
how do you um, experience yourself as a poet in society and poetry? Do you? Well, I think things like this are great because it's just a group of people and some poems and some discussion. And Marty and I do a series at Expressions Art Gallery in Ashby every second Sunday at 3 o'clock. And it's a place where writers, some of them well known, but most of them not, um, who can come and share their work and you know be appreciated. And you know, so I think there are lots of small enclaves where poetry happens, and, and I'm happy that there are things like slams for kids because that attracts them to poetry. I had one class that oh, I said, not doing their work at all. Class. I tried everything. Finally, I said, "Okay, you get a thousand points if you'll write a poem for the poetry slam, but then you have to go with me and read it there." <laughs> and I kind of turned them around. Mm -hmm. A thousand points. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> one of the teachers in the Bay of the Writing Project pointed out to us at one of his <coughs> master classes for yeah. teachers that, do you know you own all the points in the world? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the kids don't know. They you can print oh, money. The house and point. <laughs> I work, still work with the Bay Area Writing Project, so indirectly with kids. I think if I weren't writing so much, I would be doing that, because I really loved it. What is the Bay Area Writing Project? It's a university-based collaborative with teachers from grammar school through college. And um, it started here in Berkeley, at UC Berkeley, uh, when a great teacher had the idea why am I talking to these teachers about what good teaching is when they could be teaching their best lessons to one another? And so it's based on that idea. Um, and it's a place for teachers to come together and find support. You don't always find it in your school, in your classroom. Very often you don't find it. Yeah. And um, it's also based on the idea that how can you teach writing if you don't write yourself? Mm. So when you go through the Bay Area Writing Project summer program, being in a writing group is part of what we do. Sure. So we, the, our, our series of expressions is sort of an extension of that idea of sharing the writing with the bigger We're going to wrap it up. It's 3 o'clock. <laughs> this was wonderful. I thank Judy, Judy Bibbler so much for coming. And I thank you all for coming as well. Uh, we will be having, as I said, Joyce Young in June. And I'll make another little book for, uh, for her reading. So uh, keep your eyes open. Come by the library. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>